Welcome to The Roping Report. I'm your host, Jacob Esquera. Since the conclusion of the Paris Olympics and the passing of the torch, Los Angeles now braces for what could be the most televised sporting event in 2028. Yours truly will be there to cover the opening ceremonies. But let's not get into that now. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's dive into our first topic for today. The field is cryptozoology. Strange creatures spotted on TikTok video. Hmm. Let's look at that. Have you seen this video? Well, it comes to us via TikTok, Aliens and Cryptids. The video shows what appears to be two unidentified sea creatures. This happened within the Black Sea in 2023. Now, I do not give much credence to TikTok vids, as anything can and will be fabricated these days with the help of AI. However, I also believe it is very important to not just shrug off anything with a cynical mindset. The family out on the boat are afraid to get in the water after seeing two sea creatures they did not recognize. Now, some comments suggest what is being seen are a few leopard seals, or eels. But if you study the anatomy of marine life, you should know that what has been filmed are not leopard seals, but something else. I'm not sure about the head anatomy. Plesiosaurus have long snouts. No doubt marine reptiles have found a way to survive post-flood. Just look at Champ as a great example. Soft tissue research with Dr. Mark Armitage. Now, I'll bet most of you are not familiar with the work that he has done. He currently resides in Washington, and we're going to have him as our guest right now, who can enlighten us more about this amazing research. This is Dr. Mark Armitage on the Ropa Network. How's everything going in Washington right now? Well, uh, we just got back. Uh, we've only been back, I think, about a week. Uh, right now, it's a little warm and dry, uh, but it's typical for a couple of months in the summer, but we just got back from Cleveland. We attended the uh, microscopy and microanalysis annual meeting. That's for the Microscopy Society of America. I'm an editor on one of their journals, Microscopy Today. And so <clears throat> one of the advantages is that I'm required to publish. So we've been doing a lot of publishing, of course, through their journal. I think we have 13 papers now on dinosaur soft tissue, but we brought a student with us, a student from El Paso, uh, Texas, and he presented a poster. He stood up and delivered uh, to PhDs and answered some tough questions. So uh, mm. this is what we can offer students is the opportunity to do research at their school. We go into the schools and we can actually provide them with a microscope station. And so we provide them the dinosaur bones because we go on the digs, we bring the bones back. So we've got a lot of students in this program now and they can actually publish and get published. Jonas uh, Cruz, who's our student from El Paso, is only 16 and he's already published in an international journal uh, in the microscopy side of America. So it's this is really exciting. It's powerful. It is. They're getting to work on dinosaur tissues. They're actually making world first discoveries. Uh, and so it launches their career like nothing else will. And so if you know students who have a desire for science, they want to do good science and get published and do their own research. We offer that whole pathway. And uh, so. Oh, that's fantastic. It's so cool. And it, it, so many doors are opening. And um, so that's what's happening in Washington. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Jonas, he's 16 years old. Yeah, he's 16. And uh, he got invited by uh, the, the Royal Microscopy Society in London. They I said, We'll fly you and your family to London. And they want him to present because. Look, he, he is the best vehicle to reach some of these students. Uh, you know, COVID, the lockdowns, they wrecked everything. They wrecked our school system. And uh, so many yeah. of our kids are just destroyed by, by what happened. And their learning was truncated. So we're sparking their interest with dinosaur bones and microscopes. You can see the microscopes behind me. I'm prepping microscopes for these very students yep. that I'm talking about. So microscopes like these go into their school. Their teacher is trained in how to use it. And then they can do their own research with the bones that we collect on these world-famous dinosaur digs. And, and just as a sidebar, we're publishing World First on Dinosaur Soft Tissue. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's really incredible how this has worked out. And so we really want students to contact us 
and let us know if they'd like to get in on the research and publication. It, it's just there's so many careers available. Uh, I was going to say, uh, how can they get it? Just for the audience sake, Mark, how can they get in touch with you guys? Well, they can contact us at history.org. There is a contact tab on the website. Plus, they can download our books. We have free books. Uh, all of our papers are there. They can download and give them an idea of what kind of publishing they can do. But there's a contact tab there, or they can email me. You guys have my email. I'm sure you can put it mm -hmm. post-editing, uh, profmark at distry.org, and we will connect with their teachers. We first like to go into the school, and because we teach the state standards, we can go into public schools, private schools. It doesn't matter because we don't teach the controversy. <laughs> Right. Oh, then they can focus on what's under the microscope, like slides of dinosaur bones, which show clots. Did you know that almost every bone that we dig out of the ground, they're all clotted? That you can see the, the outside bone here, but this is all the inner cortical bone. And look how dark red it is. That's because it's clotted. Here's a clot in a bone. This is yep. long, uh, it's a rib bone. Look at that clot in there. That's just pure iron oxide. So all the blood stayed in the canals. There's another one here. You can see right down the, uh, this is hard to find the camera, but you can see that clot in there. That is a clot. It's a little hard to see, but that's, that's a canal with a clot in it. So every bone we find has clots. And we ask the question, well, why? And this is even down into the Permian. So we're, we're digging mostly in the Cretaceous, which is about 70 million years old, but down in the Permian, about uh, 280, 290 million years old. <clears throat> Everything mm -hmm. plotted there. Also, we ask ourselves, why? Why? Well, remember COVID, the folks who died in COVID, uh, they're all plotted. Uh, these reports are available easily. If you could search for them, just search for COVID clots. And um, you can see surgeons and, and particularly embalming folks, the funeral folks who take yeah, bodies yeah. in and prepare them. They're pulling huge cloth. See, they have to perfuse the whole body, so they need the vasculature to be clear, but they're finding they're jammed with these long, stringy, fibrous cloths. And so we think that's what happened to the dinosaurs. They all clotted. Why? Because like the COVID patients, they were drowning. COVID patients, their lungs were full of water. They had to put oxygen tube in them to keep them alive. And when they took that out, mm -hmm. down. And so that's why they got clots. And so we think uh, well, he did a poster session, which meant it was a continuous audience for two and a half hours. All these, and there were 3,500 people at the meeting, about maybe close to 4,000. 3,500. So it's a, it's a pretty decent meeting. It used to be in the tens of thousands, but COVID, you know, wrecked everything. So people from all over the world used to come. The, the first one that I attended back in 20, I guess it was 2016, was in Hartford, Connecticut. And we presented our dinosaur cells. You know, we're finding cells in these bones, which shouldn't be there either. But one of the researchers yeah. jumped up out of her chair after my presentation and said, I have to work with you. Your cells look alive. I mean, that's how stunning these images are. But uh, no, Jonas, uh, he addressed for two and a half hours. He probably talked to about 75 people. But personally, um, they stopped and stood there and he had to defend his poster and show the things that we were finding. It was a very interesting study because instead of digging bones out of the ground, we went to Montana and we collected surface bones. We thought, well, let's let's see what we, we see everything in the buried bones and they're not buried that deeply. They're a foot or less sometimes below the surface. Um, and they're full. You're doing a fantastic job. Jonas is the future yeah. of DSCRI. Yeah. If he's going to continue to be hands on yeah. and be able to speak to these large crowds and be extremely confident. Confidence is a key, folks. Yeah. If you have confidence, you can speak to these people and you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear. Jonas went in, he was invited to go to Socorro High School in, uh, in El Paso, Texas, and he presented seven periods with a little break in between. And he knocked it out of the park and the kids were mesmerized. And so we have new students who are wanting to get into this because of Jonas. You're exactly right. He's the future. Yep. Yep. And, and so this is what we need to do. We, we, need, we need students in science. A lot of people are not entering science right now. 
So we look at this as a real, hey, you know, it's a real cool opportunity to get involved. It's fun, but it's real because you're going on the digs. Jonas has been on five digs now, four or five digs, I think. And so his mom comes along. She's a super mom. I'm calling all those super moms out there who have a child mm -hmm. who you don't know what to do with, but he likes science. Let us know and we'll find a way. We'll find a way to get him or her into it. We need women in science. Our, our journal just recently had a whole issue, and I can't find it here, but women in, in microscopy. And there's a lot of powerful, wonderful women who've made huge advances in microscopy and have trained guys like me. So we need women in science. So it's a real cool pathway, but you're doing mm -hmm. research that needs to be done. Look, everybody's afraid of dinosaur soft tissue because it's a career killer. It killed my career. Um, you know, I was teaching at California State University, Northridge, when I published yep. the first paper on the Triceratops horn. And this, of course, was the tissue from the horn, the stretchy tissue that was in the movies. And um, and it, so it terminated my career. And I thought, well, OK, let's just continue publishing and maybe attract students. And it's taken off. So it's a really, really neat opportunity for kids in this country right now to take advantage of some training and some education and a pathway, a pathway that could lead to anything you want. You could sell microscopes, service microscopes, run a microscope company. You could work in medicine, academia, forensics. I mean, the list is so long of people who use microscopes and need technicians, technologists, PhDs to run these departments and such. So we can help yep. go get that dream. How did Hell Creek go this year? Uh, we dug in a Glen Dive at the uh, Bice Ranch this year, and it was great. Uh, we we collected a, a, a Triceratops tibia, uh, which is one of the long bones, <clears throat> and it was it was enormous. I mean, the screen is too small for me to show how large it was, but uh, mm -hmm. but we take specimens from that because we destroy bones. That's one of the things the paleontologists don't like us too much because we actually melt the bones. Because that's where all the soft tissue is. It's it's inside the bone. So we put this in like a vinegar and, and it, it dissolves and all the tissues fall out. All the nerves and cells, they fall out on the Petri dish. And then we can collect them by pipette and put them on slides and examine them and photograph them and publish them. Um, and so it's a, it's a fairly straightforward protocol. It's like a kitchen recipe that even 14-year-olds can do in their lab at school and look at this stuff right yep. away through their microscope. So, uh, but we did really well. We collected uh, a lot of newer things. Uh, we dug deeper below where the first horn was found and we found a second horn. And so Wonderful. we took that out. And, uh, but we collected a lot in Wyoming at the Hanson Ranch, uh, beautiful bones there. And we were hoping to go to Jordan, Montana, but our van, which is, famous for being on the digs, uh, had a $2,000 hiccup. So the money that we were going, ah. going to Jordan, Montana, and that's where we collected Nano Tyrannus, which is a very controversial. Yeah. Dinosaur. yeah. Um, but just recently uh, talked about that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, back. we, we were volunteers to come with us uh, on the dig. So I think we had two years ago, we had 21 volunteers last year. I think we had about 15. So, but uh, okay. if you want to come on a dig, just as a family, you know, super mom, super dad, listen up. You can bring your family uh, on a dig for a week. Uh, you can take home your own bones. Sometimes you find teeth. Now, you have to haggle and barter with the dig operator because, you know, a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of these dig operators, they're ranchers. And the beef industry really did them wrong. They They really can't grow beef profitably anymore. So... They've turned to these dinosaur bones as a means of income. So we like to support them. But it's only about 50 a cost. day for a child and 100 a day for an adult. And we dig for three okay. days. So come with us. Help us. I need workers. I need worker bees who will go out and help me dig these bones out of the ground. But you can take some home. And if you want to do the research, great. If you want to just draw, you know, we, we do our old stretchy books. I don't know if your folks are familiar with our yep. old Remember those. We need artists to help us draw because I can't draw very well. And uh, <laughs> that was my cover. I did that whole drawing myself. So, <laughs> hey, hey, it works. It's effective. 
<laughs> okay, so you're looking at $100 per day. Anyone who wants to go on these digs, that's, that's kind of a rare thing if you think about it. it. Most organizations don't publicize going for a dig venture and being able to take home something, being part of the excavation process, the paleontology work. This is what Mark offers, and I urge everybody get involved if they can. Do what you can to support this organization. I know I personally was going to try and get to the dig. I didn't make it. I'm going to shoot for next year. That's for sure. I know it's uh, the nearest airport, I think, might be two and a half, three hours away, maybe, yeah, from a location. For one of us to come get you if you, if you can't do a car. Uh, folks can carpool. You know, like I say, we usually take the big blue van, and that seat's nine or ten. So if everybody okay. coordinated and flew in together, we'll come get you. Sure. And take you back, no problem. But uh, no, it's it's well, a, like a lifetime. Yeah, it's a once in a lifetime. Excellent. I, I'll say it is. We definitely need to go out there. That's for sure. I'm glad you're seeing the whole scope of things, and that uh, these kids are coming along, and people are getting hands-on experience on how to see things under the microscope. It's kind of what I do here and there, but not on the same level. Of we have our own lab, but. Not like this. So the work is fantastic, Mark, and I, I love everything you're doing. The vision and build it up, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got to start somewhere. And look where it's going now, Mark. Wow. And you cemented your name in something that's extremely important to all of society that uh, wants to learn the truth about these amazing animals. And uh, unfortunately, they're being fed the wrong information. But your group and your organization is on the right track and doing the right thing for all of us. So thank you for sharing all that amazing work and, and what we can expect in the future. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I appreciate all the work you're doing. Please post our information so people can stay in touch. And uh, we answer all emails. Uh, you can even text me. If, if you want my phone number, I'll give you that. You can text me. But yeah, we're, we're very happy. It's and By the way, it's not about me. None of this is about me. It's about the Lord. It's about uh, who we are as human beings, what's happening to us right now and where we're going. Uh, there's yep. a choice there where where we can go. And so uh, that's really what it's all about, but we're using it uh, as a, a big excitement tool for everybody because everybody's benefiting from it and people are learning, you know, maybe the flood really was real. Maybe these organisms did die in a flood and that's why they're all, all of them full of clods. Uh, and we're the only ones finding clods and talking about them. They show them in their pictures. When we look in the journals, we can see their thin sections like we make, and they're full of clots also, but they haven't tested them with the iron revealing microscope. We have a fluorescent microscope that makes the iron glow. So, and it's 100% iron. It's, it's just pure blood that's locked yep. in these bone canals. So, no, it's good for everybody, and, and we're really great. We're really excited about the positive message that it is all the way around. I agree. We're excited for what you're doing too, and I'm going to continue to. Um publicize what you're doing and show everybody exactly. on our network all the work that you're doing. So we appreciate all of it. So I'd like to stay in touch here and there. I'll reach out to you uh, maybe once a year, maybe a little bit more than that, see how things are going, how things are progressing. And uh, I'd love to be able to see um, photos from your dig sites um, of all the interaction with your your young audience and everything, see how the, and they're enjoying themselves. I'd like to be able to post that for all of us to see too, if we get to that. that it has those pictures of the digs. I'm a little behind schedule, so I'm going to post some here pretty soon. But yeah, uh, mark.armitage.98, and you can uh, friend us there. And that way you can keep updates because uh, we do publicize regular functions like the digs that we're doing, and we invite everybody to come. It's, it's all free. You don't pay us. You pay the dig operators and the hotel operators. But we do everything. For you. Right. That's the way Jesus did it. That's the way we're going to do it. Exactly. <laughs> you got the right mindset there, Mark. Mark, thank you so much for your time. I want to be able to show this to the, all the audience out there in Oregon and then and so forth. So keep up the great work, and thank you so much for joining us on the Ropa Network. Thank you. New pterosaur species found on the Isle of Skye. In February of 2024, a scientist announced the discovery of a well-preserved three-dimensional pterosaur skeleton on the Isle of Skye, Scotland. The pterosaur named Chiophthora evansae is believed to have lived during the Middle Jurassic period thousands of years ago. My words, not theirs. The fossil is estimated to have had a wingspan of 1.6 meters and is part of the Darwinoptera clad of pterosaurs. 
Sometimes new discoveries take a long time to surface. Paleontologists first saw the bones of the new pterosaur in 2006 during a field trip to the southwest coast of the Isle of Skye. They have since spent years carefully preparing the fossils, which remain almost entirely embedded in rock, in the matrix, as the scientists say, for analysis. The find is only a partial skeleton consisting of shoulders, wings, legs, and backbone, but the scientists have said the bones belong to a single pterosaur. The discovery was led by scientists from the Natural History Museum, University of Bristol, University of Leicester, and University of Liverpool, and their findings were finally published just this year in the journal of Vertebrate Paleontology on February 5th, 2024, so not that long ago, folks. The fossil is considered to be a significant find because it provides new insights into pterosaur diversity and history and helps to improve the fossil record of middle Jurassic pterosaurs. The name Chiroptera comes from the Scottish Gaelic word, which means mist, and is a reference to the Isle of Skye's Gaelic name, Isle of Mists. The ancient flying reptiles are more commonly associated with Eastern Asia. Finding Chiroptera evansae in Scotland provides important new data on the geographic range of Darwinoptera, they wrote. Next subject I want to talk about is something that was recently brought up, and that is whether or not the Tyrannosaur has lips. After thinking about this a little bit more and doing some more research on it, heavy, heavy research, I may have to change my mind on what I think about that. So the anatomy change, new information which may sway my conclusion, should I be pro or in opposition to? A recent paper by Colin Larson, Witten, Scott Mayhew, Brink Evans, and Rise, that's a lot of names there, March of 1923 was just published again, and they used Vernata lizards as a model for theropods to have lips. Well, lizards, snakes, and tuatara are lipidosaurs, deopsids, two totally different groups that are not related at all. It's more like comparing apples to melons, really. To put lizard morphology into dinosaurs is completely wrong. Dinosaurs are not lizards. And this is what I was saying before I went ahead with this uh, OMSI visit. There's a part of me kept saying, why are we comparing lizards to reptiles? They're not the same thing. And what do you know? Someone actually feels the same way I do. Taxonomic distinction. Dinosaurs, crocodiles, and turtles are all archosaurs, a group of reptiles that have a common ancestor. In contrast, lizards, snakes, and tuataras belong to Lepidosauria, which is a separate lineage. Correct. Morphological differences. Since archosaurs and lipidosaurs are distinct branches, their anatomical features adaptations differ significantly. For example, dinosaurs and other archosaurs do not share the same scale structures or other external features with modern lizards. That is correct. Implications of reconstruction. When reconstructing or modeling dinosaurs, it's crucial to use appropriate analogs for their own lineage, rather than applying features from unrelated groups like modern lizards. For instance, recent studies such as the one by Colin Larson and colleagues suggest that some theropods might have had lips similar to those of certain modern reptiles. But these features should be interpreted to the context of archosaur characteristics, not lepidosaur ones. Misconceptions. Applying lepidosaur features like the scales of an iguana to dinosaurs can lead to inaccurate depictions. Dinosaurs were not lizards, and their skin and other features should not be reconstructed based on their closest relatives within Archosauria. Something to keep in mind for the future. But we're going to come across these articles more and more, aren't we? Let's talk about the Paris Games. With so much controversy over the opening ceremonies, and rightfully so, Voices have been heard and action has been taken so much now that even the opposing side wants to sue Christians for showing disapproval of Thomas Jolly's pagan blasphemic agenda. I don't think that's going to go well in the courtroom, folks. Women's boxing was certainly a disgrace as male boxer Imani Khalif and his XY chromosomes pounded female Olympians into submission. One athlete shouted, this is unjust. I fully agree with her. As the Olympic Committee is to blame here, allowing a man to compete against women just because he is confused about who he really is. However, rumors have been stirring that Iron Mike Tyson will be glad to wear a wig and step into the ring with the gender-confused fairy. I think I would pay to see that, folks. You know, something that most people aren't talking about is the Israeli athletes. Tom Riovenny won Israel's first gold medal of the Paris Olympics while windsurfing. And that was a windsurfing final. 
while Sharon Cantor nabbed silver in the women's event, and artistic gymnast Artem Dolofate won silver in the floor exercise. The three medals bring Israel's total count in Paris to six, surpassing Israel's previous record of four at a single Olympics, which it achieved at the 2020 Olympic Games. Saturday was also the first time Israel won three medals in a single day. Rio Veni's gold, Israel's fourth ever, comes 20 years after his coach, Gail Fridman, won Israel's first ever gold medal at the 2004 Athens Games in the men's sailboard competition. Israel last won a sailing medal in 2008. Israel now has won 19 Olympic medals, five of which have come in sailing events. Judo is Israel's most decorated sport, with nine. Israel earlier won three medals in judo in Paris, and two silvers and one bronze. How about that? Rio Veni mentioned that his country's unprecedented success has come in wartime. His words, my brother has been a combat soldier since the war began. It was so hard to go training while everyone else was crying over lost people, dead people, Rio Veni added. It's been so hard and I still had to put my head down and keep training, and it's all for this moment. He's right. Israeli President Isaac Herzog called Ruveni to congratulate him on his gold medal win. You made an entire nation happy, a nation that is at war and that is praying for the return of its hostages. You brought us a great light. You caused our national anthem to be played at the Olympics in Paris. Indeed, he did. Jewish American Olympic wrestler displays hostages pin after gold medal victory. This is something they didn't want you to see, folks. Amit Alor, who won her first Olympic medal on Tuesday, stands with Israel after October 7th massacre by publicly displaying her yellow hostage pin and talking about her connection to the Jewish state. Although she represents the U.S., quite a few Israeli spectators eagerly followed Elor's wrestling final on Tuesday evening. The 20-year-old Jewish-American wrestler won a gold medal in Paris in her first Olympic Games. Elor is the youngest daughter of two Israelis who immigrated to the U.S. in 1980. Her father, Yer, a former Israeli shotput champion, moved to America with his wife, Elena, and they raised a family of magnificent wrestlers. Aside from the Olympic gold medal, Elor hasn't lost a match in the previous five years since her last loss in 2019. She has won eight world championships in both age group and senior level competitions. Many in Israel have heard the champion's story, her close connection to the country of the recent request of the Israeli Olympic Committee to convince Elor to represent the country in the next Olympics, 2028. During the interviews following her victory, she held up the yellow ribbon pin that symbolizes the struggle to return the hostages and said, bring them home. Regardless of what you think of the Olympic Committee and their offensive yet controversial role they have indoctrinated in the 2024 Paris Games, it's really not about them. It's about the athletes. The Olympic Games is a time for all Americans to embrace our athletes and commend them for their amazing accomplishments. Just getting to the Olympic Games means so much for all these athletes participating. It is a struggle and victory. It is a time for all nations to come together as one and celebrate in unity. The pride and achievement that their athletes have worked so hard for. Those men and women out there have the right to represent their country. It gives them the honor and pride like no other. It is what being an Olympian is is all about. We end our program tonight with a look back at a few gold medal victories from Paris, and we look ahead to Los Angeles in 2028. I plan to be there in person for the opening ceremony, a promise I made to myself after the 96 Atlanta Games. Cole Hawker won a gold medal in the men's 1500 meter final at the Paris Olympics on August 6th. He went from fifth place to first in a matter of seconds. While his opponents Josh Kerr of Great Britain and Norway's Jacob Ingebrigtsen wasted energy on trash-talking one another, Cole was cool and collective. Sydney McLaughlin describes how she stayed zeroed in on her Olympic dreams and what role her husband Andre Lavron plays in her life. Sydney broke the world record in the women's 400-meter hurdle on Thursday, August 8th in Paris, winning gold for the U.S. in the event for the second straight Olympics. I pray my journey may be a clear depiction of submission and obedience to God. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when it doesn't seem possible, He makes the impossible possible. Finally, who could have forget the power of Katie Ledecky? 
She now becomes the most decorative woman swimmer and female athlete in U.S. history. A four-time U.S. Olympic swimmer, nine-time Olympic gold medalist, and 14 total, 21-time world champion. You know, every time it's a big event, championships, Olympics, you win, you set world records. What is it about you that performs the best on the biggest stage? Honestly, I, I think my faith is the biggest factor. Just trusting the Lord and trusting the plan He has for me. Uh, it doesn't always guarantee things are going to go amazing, but I just give all the honor and glory to Him every time I step on the track, and I just I'm amazed with what He. In about 22 or 24 seconds through the first 200, and she is running away with it as we expected. It goes by Hannah Klaus of Belgium. Look who is next best. Look on the inside. It's Joseph of South Africa. It's going to be a race for second because Sydney's cruising down the home stretch on the inside. That's why the crowd's going crazy. The French Open has run her way into second and the final. So I kind of thought to myself, okay, let's let's medal now. And then I had to re, re kind of calibrate, pick a new route, and then again it opened up and just I just let God carry me to the finish line. It's just Karen.